From the world of politics. We need to stop advertising for Florida, which is we've become the biggest ad agency for Florida. To the world of business. It was telling us that we've got an economy that's on fire right now. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. 100 days ago, President Biden announced a review of the range of supply chain issues that are facing the United States today. And today, we got the results of that review, together with plans to address the issues that were identified. Welcome now, Dr. Jared Bernstein. He's a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. So, Dr. Bernstein, thank you so much for being back with us. This is a wide-ranging report, 250 pages, as, as I counted them, uh, and it covers things like farm pharmaceuticals and batteries and rare earths. I want to focus on one, though, in particular, and that's semiconductors, because there's a fair amount in here on semiconductors. One of the things you recommend is appropriation of $50 billion to invest in production of semiconductors, build those plants. How did you come up with that number? How do we know that's enough or not too much? Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this critically important report. And I'll get to your semiconductor question, which, of course, is uh, of such core importance to uh, the economy and the auto industry in particular. Uh, this is a report, though, that uh, it explains the pathway to a much more resilient and a much less fragile global supply chain serving the U.S. economy. Uh, we're talking about bringing back advanced manufacturing, making a strong play for a global share in large capacity batteries, d diversifying access to critical inputs, and of course, one of those has to be semiconductors. In terms of uh, the, the $50 billion investment, this is a deep and uh, uh, consequential magnitude of an, of an investment uh, in, uh, in producing semiconductors and subsidizing the building of semiconductor plants, the financing. It, in, in terms of where it comes from, uh, it's related to the CHIPS Act, which is something that the Senate has been uh, talking about or some variation of that recently. And my understanding is that has uh, a pretty significant bipartisan support. So uh, I, it, it's it, I think it's gratifying to me to hear uh, that politicians of both sides of the aisle that often have trouble coming together on uh, important issues like this are doing so when it comes to uh, meeting and facing and pushing back on these supply uh, chain constraints. It did strike me in reading it that it probably is not a coincidence that, as I understand it, that bill that's pending right now, the Senate's supposed to vote on maybe today, is $52 billion, just about your $50 billion number. It looks like that's going to go through with bipartisan support, as you say, on the Senate side. But on the House side, it's much more trouble. Are you going to have trouble with the Democrats getting this done? Well, uh, as an economist here, I have the privilege of not having to do these kinds of nose counts. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, Representative DeFazio has been out front on many of these infrastructure issues, uh, pulling out parts of the jobs plan, the president's jobs plan, uh, that uh, are very much in sync with what's coming over from the Senate. So uh, I, while I can't speak to uh, this vote or that vote, uh, certainly I believe that the uh, the sentiment has real momentum there, again, coming over from a bipartisan thrust in the Senate. But I also have to talk a little bit about the preferences of the American people. Whether they're D's or R's, people are consistently telling pollsters, I mean numbers that go way north of 50 percent, that they want to see these kinds of investments made in American infrastructure. Why? Not because they're tracking you know, semiconductors or R&D as a share of GDP, but they recognize that to be competitive in this global economy, we cannot depend on fragile supply chains uh, that served us poorly when the pandemic hit. So here we have the president of the United States uh, and, uh, and the Senate, as we discussed today, responding in a way that I haven't seen government respond before to uh, this, uh, this, this, con this economic constraint that has uh, been in place for a long time with with inadequate government response. So fair enough on the politics point. So let's talk about as an economist. Again, let's assume you get the $50 billion. What will it buy and when will it be up and running? Because as you know, a lot of U.S. industry right now needs those semiconductors yesterday. OK, so this is dedicated funding for semiconductor manufacturing uh, and for R&D. Uh, and uh, it takes a couple of years to stand up a semiconductor fab. I think probably listeners to this station know that. 
Um, however, that's not the only initiative that was announced today. The other initiative that was announced, uh, similar to this one, was much more of a near-term set of initiatives, one led by the Secretaries of Commerce, Agriculture, and Transportation in the areas of home building, construction, lumber, semiconductors, transportation, and food. And therein, uh, I believe you'll start hearing comments from that task force in ways to try to alleviate some of these bottlenecks in the near term. You know, uh, it takes about 100 semiconductors to, uh, to build a car these days, I'm told. And if you saw these articles with President Biden uh, out today, you, you saw him holding a semiconductor. My first thought was, uh, hey, let's put that back in a car. Uh, <laughs> so uh, certainly the urgency is one that we feel strongly here uh, in the White House. Will that task force be essentially doing triage? Because to date, thus far, as I understand it, the White House has been reluctant to say, OK, the semiconductors we have go to that industry rather than that one. And if it isn't triage, then what can they really do to address the bottlenecks? Well, one of the things they can do is they can get together with uh, uh, the folks who have ground-level information on these bottlenecks and these constraints. And by the way, not just in semiconductors, but in all kinds of logistics. I had a great conversation the other day with someone who was really educating me on, uh, on the containers that go on container ships and the kind of logistical headaches that we've had in that regard. Just uh, on every link of the supply chain, there are experts out there with whom uh, this task force will be closely consulting. Some of those meetings will be public, by the way. And so there will be more information forthcoming on precise measures that this more near-term initiative will be taking, uh, as I said, in, in weeks, not months. So let's take a look at the longer term, if you could. I mean, if you were running a company, you'd be saying, we don't have a problem just now. We've got to think about where we're going to be in three years, five years, even 10 years. Right. We've seen a huge demand for segment conductors, in part because of the pandemic. But let's be honest, the entire economy is moving, whether it's electric vehicles or so many other uses of semiconductors. What will this $50 billion do in terms of what are needed in the out years? What are you projecting in terms of semiconductor need and fulfilling that five years from now, seven years from now? Well, I think that the, uh, the, the thrust of the report is that this is not a one-time temporary initiative uh, to just kind of look at supply chains, say what we know, and get out of the way. What we're trying to do here is a deep set of information gathering so that we identify every tangible constraint in, in, in the supply chains, areas where we think markets can make a difference, and areas where, uh, where, where, where government needs to take a role. As far as semiconductors are concerned, you know, it is no, I'm sure you know this and your viewers, it is no accident that, that Korea and Taiwan are major producers of semiconductors. And it's also no accident that when that narrow, uh, kind of just-in-time supply chain uh, took a hit, uh, we got into the kind of problems that we're talking about today, particularly in autos. So we're talking about um, long-term portfolio investments in uh, trying to dedicate funding for semiconductor manufacturing. Now, some of that's going to take place in the near term, and we have to observe how our investments play out. Uh, obviously, you don't want to try to fix a problem five years away if, if that problem is, 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 uh, isn't existing. You, have to, yeah, you don't know what it's going, what its depth is going to look like. But in the near term, uh, we know we have to do something about uh, helping autos get the, uh, the inputs they need. And in the medium term, uh, that $50, $50 billion investment, both coming from the White House and from the Senate side right now, at least uh, in terms of the negotiations I'm hearing about, uh, that's, that's a strong medium-term play for standing up uh, semiconductor uh, domestic capacity. So, Jared, you mentioned Korea, which really is a leader, as you say, in this area, along with Taiwan. I, I wonder, reading this report, I don't want to say it's depending on the kindness of strangers, but the kindness of allies, because one of the things in here is $17 billion has been announced by Korean companies investing in the United States. Is is that part of the strategy to get our allies to invest in facilities here in the United States to make semiconductors? I would say that the key strategy here is to stand up a domestic uh, part of the industry. By the way, the report is quite clear on this point. It says that we are not going to replace globalization uh, with uh, uh, domestic production in, in, well, uh, uh, at 100 percent. Uh, we're going to make sure that our global portfolio is much less fragile, much more resilient, much wider, so that we're not dependent on a couple of links in the supply chain. But when we talk about standing up production here, some of that's going to be domestic, some of that's going to be from uh, other companies. The key thing there, by the way, is the quality of the jobs, which is something that this president never forgets about. So if you're going to build a factory here, uh, the goal in this report is to make sure that the workers who uh, fill that factory are adequately trained, that they have the skills, and that they're um, 
that they're remunerated commensurately with what they're bringing to the table. That means uh, union jobs in many cases. It certainly means uh, a, a, a fair level of pay and compensation. So that's another side of this puzzle that's uh, extremely important to this president. And one more piece of the puzzle that's identified in this report, and that is trade. Uh, for example, you have some tariffs maybe to impose on some magnets that, frankly, I'm not that familiar with, but are critical in some of the mo electric motors. Uh, what is the role of trade in here? Do we need to really be regulating what is coming into the country in order to, supply our, to, to, to protect our supply chains? Well, I think the most important innovation there in the, in the report is setting up what's something called the, uh, the Trade Strike Task, uh, task Force, uh, which, by the way, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors, of which I'm a member, is, uh, is, a, uh, is on that task force. And the idea there is to have a, a group within our administration, of course, working closely with USTR, to uh, monitor trade practices and to uh, hit back hard when those practices are unfair. Some of that might be dumbing, dumping, some of that might be uh, currency management, uh, but there, the, the, the point is to make sure that the playing field in terms of international competition is, is level, uh, which isn't always the case, and have a task force whose job it is to watch for that. But at the same time, I think the key to the report that I've been stressing is to not be passive and, you know, sort of sit back and watch other countries with whom we compete invest deeply in R&D, invest deeply in their supply chains, invest deeply in the kinds of rare earths and materials that you need for semiconductors or, or those that you need for pharmaceuticals and just kick back and watch it happen and, and basically ignore the supply chain landing where we, we, we've landed in a place where that supply chain isn't as sustainable and reliable as it needs to be. And in that regard, uh, we're talking about policies that go, you know, all the way from uh, making sure workers are paid fairly for the kinds of jobs that this will create to making sure that these, uh, these supply chains are, are, are stood up with speed and uh, efficiency. Dr. Bernstein, thank you so very much for your time today. Really appreciate this. Jared Bernstein, he's a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Coming up, Ford announces its new Maverick pickup, and Kumar Galhotra, he is head of Ford Americas, was here to tell us all about it. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we're going to go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. I'm deeply sorry. That apology from the chief executive of Colonial Pipeline, who testified before the U.S. Senate panel. Last month, a ransomware attack paralyzed the East Coast's flow of gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel. It was the hardest decision I've made in my 39 years in the energy industry, and I know how critical our pipeline is to the country and I put the interests of the country first. I kept the information closely held because we were concerned about operational safety and security, and we wanted to stay focused on getting the pipeline back up and running. I believe with all my heart, it was the right choice to make. Mr. Blunt's appearance comes a day after the Justice Department said it recovered the majority of the Bitcoin ransom that was paid. The Senate could vote as early as today on legislation designed to increase U.S. competitiveness against China. The bill calls for spending more than $200 billion for domestic semiconductor output and increased federal research and development. The perceived threat from China has united Republicans and Democrats in Congress. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Ford is announcing today its all-new 2022 Maverick pickup. It's a full hybrid that boasts of being the most fuel-efficient pickup in the market. And to help us introduce it now, we welcome Kumar Galhotra. He is president of Ford Americas and International Markets. So, Kumar, thank you so much for being with us. Tell us all about this new pickup you have. It's a full hybrid, as I say, and it's reasonably priced, I would say. Yeah, thank you for having me, David. Uh, yes, a very affordable, very capable uh, pickup. You know, we're constantly looking at our customer base and the marketplace uh, for opportunities. And we noticed that there's a, there's a huge opportunity for a very affordable pickup that's extremely capable, under $20,000 starting price, room for five adults, lots of storage space, 
very compact, very easy to maneuver. It's got about the same uh, interior room as, as the, the Ford, Ford Fusion. And even at that price point, comes loaded with all kinds of interesting features. It's got an eight inch touchscreen, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, Copass Connect. You know, it's got a modem. You can, you can uh, start the vehicle remotely. You can stop it. You can lock it, unlock it. Uh, great stereo system uh, and EPA estimated mileage of 40 miles per gallon in the city. And all of that, uh, $420,000. So really excited to, uh, to serve these customers uh, who, who need this product that's at that price point with that kind of capability. Yeah, it's a very interesting product, but I'm curious with all the talk about electric vehicles right now, including from Ford, who's really moving rapidly into electric vehicles, why are you doing a hybrid? Why isn't this full electric? Well, it's primarily the price point. Uh, I, uh, all battery electric vehicles are, are still substantially more expensive to create uh, than the internal combustion engines. Uh, and, you know, we're leaning way into our battery electric plans. You know, we've, the Mustang Mach-E is doing great. Uh, we're going to launch the Transit van later this year. That's the Transit all electric. And of course the all electric, uh, you know, F-150 Lightning uh, that we, we launched uh, uh, just a few days ago and has got great reception, great order. So, we're leaning well into it, but there will be room for other products that are that need to be at a much lower price point like this one, uh, where we wanted to do both. We wanted to create a very clean engine, a very environmentally friendly engine uh, with the hybrid 40 miles per gallon, uh, but are also at a very affordable price for these customers. You know, a lot of customers don't have that choice right now. Uh, they end up buying a used vehicle and even the used car prices are now up to $22,000. So to offer a brand new vehicle that, as you can, you're showing, can, can tow a 23 foot trailer uh, at this price point is uh, really exciting for us. How do you make money out at that low price point? I mean, I, you're manufacturing in Mexico. Is that part of it? That's uh, that's certainly uh, part of it. But the bigger part of it is our scale. Uh, the platform uh, that this vehicle is on is shared across multiple vehicle lines across the the world. Uh, and some very clever engineering and clever manufacturing, and of course, manufacturing in Mexico uh, makes all of that, uh, that uh, makes a viable business case for us to, to produce this vehicle. Kumar, as you know so well, semiconductors are really <laughs> hard to come by these days, including for Ford. We just had a conversation with the White House about their supply chain report out today. They want to invest something like $50 billion in, in semiconductors. Where is Ford right now in semiconductors? How much do you need? And will that $50 billion investment get you where you need to go? So the, the investment you're talking about is it'll take some time for that to get into the system, create the factories and, and uh, bring the supply online. Uh, in the short term, uh, we expect second half to be certainly better than the first half. Uh, and then in terms of in, our inventories, you know, June is probably going to be a really lean inventory month, but over the second half, we start to improve. We think by fourth quarter, um, it should be much improved but there is some risk that it'll spill into uh, early part of 2022 as well. Uh, but David, you know, we're, we're like every industry and specifically the auto industry, uh, we're learning from this experience. We're, we're doing all kinds of uh, creative things to keep our production running uh, and, you know, come out of it as, at a, as a leaner company that knows how to, how to work with much leaner inventories uh, and still serve our customers uh, the vehicles that they want. How do you make sure you don't have this problem in the future? I mean, is there any thought at all that Ford might actually start making its own vertically integrated chip manufacturer or have some other sort of relationship with the chip provider that would be longer term? Yeah, the, in the long term, um, I think the fundamental issue here is, or, or the solution here is all of us need to eliminate future vulnerabilities inside our supply chain. You know, you can have, the, this this issue is like tier three or four for us. We buy a module from a certain company that buy a chip from a certain company that buy a wafer from a certain company. And it's those wafer manufacturers who are constrained. So a very thorough analysis of supply chain, not just for our chips, for even other future commodities that go into batteries, for example, uh, is very, very necessary. So we're working with uh, our supplier partners. We're working uh, with obviously our MPNL team is doing a fantastic job. Uh, and then with the administration, uh, uh, you know, in the investment in R and D and setting up some, uh, some, uh, some more capacity in the United States is going to be very, very important. 
Okay, Kumar, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. And congratulations on the new Ford Maverick pickup. That's Kumar Kalhotra. He is Ford Motors Americas and International Markets Group president. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Our stock of the hour is German pharmaceutical company CureVac, down on news of yet another delay in approval of its COVID vaccine. Stocks editor Dave Wilson is here with the story. Dave? Thank you, David. Uh, CureVac had anticipated that the COVID-19 vaccine is working on would receive approval by June. I mean, uh, you had their CEO, Franz Werner Haas, talking about that timetable back in February. Well, now it looks like it's not going to happen. You have Reuters reporting that the European regulators who have to decide on this shot may not make a decision before August. Uh, it may have to do, to some extent, with a holdup in the target date for uh, the final stage trial of this uh, particular vaccine, which, by the way, uses the same messenger RNA technology as the ones from Pfizer and BioNTech and from Moderna. And the European Union has deals for up to 405 million doses, 225 million up front, and options for another 180 million. So they definitely have a dog in the hunt. And you see how uh, that compares with some of the other uh, vaccines that are already approved, and also one uh, from, from Sanofi of France that's uh, in development. So, you know, this is a company, CureVac, that can definitely use uh, good news on uh, the vaccine, and it's really not getting it. You see the shares, uh, you know, they're, they're up almost sevenfold in the past year, but they've really been up and down since December. And as far as the company goes, it's kind of like Moderna in that it didn't really have a business before it started working on the vaccine, and now it's really looking to develop one. Analysts are anticipating billion-dollar-plus sales starting this year, according to our estimates here at Bloomberg. So are they, do they have to get the European clearance? I mean, could they come to the FDA directly? Well, I mean, there's certainly that possibility. But, you know, unlike uh, BioNTech, which, of course, is also German, uh, it's not like they have a, a U.S. partner. So, you know, their focus has really been on the EU up front. And so getting that approval really kind of sets a, a, a tone in terms of seeking uh, similar authorization elsewhere. Yeah, it's disappointing for them, no doubt about it. Thank you so much to Dave Wilson, our stocks editor. Coming up, we talk with retired General Keith Alexander about the aftermath of the cyber attack on Colonial Pipeline. This is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Canada is preparing to relax quarantine rules for travelers from the United States who are fully vaccinated with a COVID-19 shot. Bloomberg has learned within the next few days, the 14-day isolation period for visitors could be loosened. Restrictions still remain. This includes only allowing in fully vaccinated visitors who still must present a negative COVID test. Border restrictions have been in place since March of 2020. Wall Street is getting more optimistic about persuading workers to come back to the office. According to a survey by the Partnership for New York City, employers in the financial services industry expect 61% of staff to be back by the end of September. That's up from 50% in March. About 14% of finance workers have already made their way back. Around the world, hundreds were arrested as part of an FBI sting. Operation Trojan Shield involved police swoops in 16 nations. It involved an encrypted communications platform used by organized crime to move drugs and order assassinations. In addition to the 800 arrests, 32 tons of drugs and more than 48 million in cash and cryptocurrencies were seized. Australia's federal police commander calls it, quote, a watershed moment in global law enforcement history, end quote. 
It's a sign that law enforcement can pursue online criminals even when they operate outside the nation's borders. The United States says it has recovered almost all the Bitcoin ransom paid to the perpetrators of the cyber attack on Colonial Pipeline last month. The seizure amounted to $2.3 million. The FBI was able to find the Bitcoin by recovering the digital addresses the hackers used to transfer the funds. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. We're going to stay on that subject of cyber hacking. Major network outages first thing this morning raised concerns for some of us about another possible cyber attack, even as Congress was about to hear about the last one from the CEO of Colonial Pipeline. Welcome now, retired General Keith Alexander, chairman of Iron Net so Cybersecurity. General Alexander earlier served as director of national intelligence and as commander of the U.S. Cyber Command. So, General, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, as far as we know, it was a fastly issue this morning with the outages. I'm not sure there's a cyber attack unless you know something else. So maybe we should focus on the Colonial Pipeline specifically. We heard from the CEO today, testimony before Congress, and I must say in listening to it, it sounds like both on the private side and the public side, we don't quite have our act together to respond to these in a quick and efficient and determined way. Well, that's a great point, David, we don't. And when you think about it, it this is a complex area where how do private companies that are being attacked by nation states and those who have nation state like capabilities are attacking companies like Colonial Pipelines and like JBS and others. When you look at that, we're in a unique position now with the internet and with what's going on in these types of attacks. Companies are expected to defend themselves. And so Colonial Pipeline is put into a really difficult job. They can't defend themselves from this type of attack. And then we question them, why did they pay or what were they doing? When the real question, David, I think is, how do we stop this as a nation? You know, it's interesting, I'm an army guy or a previous army guy, but the Barbary Coast, you look at yeah. the pirates that were back in Jefferson's time, what did we do about that? We went after those. I think what the FBI did to go after and get this money back, that was great in the Department of Justice, absolutely great. But how do we prevent these? And the answer, I think President Biden actually had in the first page of his report, his executive order, the public and the private sector need to work together. We need to create, if you will, a radar system that shows these attacks so our government can do something about it. And then on the point that you just brought out, the government then has to work together to practice what they're gonna do. Who's the point of contact at DHS, FBI, NSA, Cyber Command? How do they work this together? Train to that. That's what we need to do as a nation. Train the public sector and then train the private and public sector to defend this country. I think we can do this but we have to move out. The good, I think the really good part, uh, pending uh, confirmation, right. there's some great people that the administration is bringing in, like Chris Inglis and Jen Easterly, and they've got Ann Newberger, and you've got General Nakasone. They're bringing in a world-class team. So let's We now need to work. Let's take, let's take in the order that you presented it. Let's do private sector, then public sector. On the private sector side, uh, does the private sector need some help? And I don't mean money or advice. I mean some requirements. Because one of the things that came out in the testimony today was specifically that the Department of Homeland Security had offered to go inspect the pipeline and help them with their cybersecurity, and they didn't take them up on the offer. Should we require inspections the way we do for FDA, for meat and things like that? Should we require instant reporting up to the proper authorities? Well, I think there's going to be increased looks at things like uh, NIST framework for cybersecurity. How do you ensure that you're protected? It will probably be best implemented from the insurance industry side, like we did fire codes and other things. But I think we should help companies move down that road. I'm not sure that it's the government's responsibility to do that as much as the private sector should come up with those like the National Institute for Standards and Technology does in those framework, implement that. And then the company, the, the C-suite and the board should say, are we following that? I think that's the way to do this. Does that make sense, David? It makes perfect sense. But let me ask a specific question. I don't want to beat up on Colonial here. They're the victim here. I don't envy that that's CEO's right. position. At the same time, when he was asked today that they had single or dual authorization for their for their crypto protection, he said single. I mean, I don't know anything about this area. And I've heard that companies should have dual authorization. So how do we get everybody to, to, to get on board? Well, I think the two-factor authentication is absolutely vital. Um, we use it. I think others uh, should. 
I think that's a key thing, especially for sensitive areas. When you're getting access to something, make them put in a code that's only to the phone of the person who could possibly do it. That shuts down a lot of this. So that two-factor authentication is extremely important. And it's a good thing. Now, companies have to move there. Uh, that's part of that framework. So let's get or key paces. Here's what you need to do. Here's how you need to do it. General, you mentioned the Barbary Coast. Uh, and as I recall, we sent the US Navy over there in the early 19th century. Uh, it, it looks pretty clear that these attacks are originating in Russia, whether the government was directly involved or not. Does there have to be the threat and even the willingness to follow through on some sort of retaliation against Russia? Well, I do think we have to hold these people accountable that's doing it. So there's two parts to hold them accountable. First, find out who they are. So that's that public-private partnership. Create that radar system, if you will, to say it's those guys there. And then hold them accountable. And I think that's where our government has to push back on Russia to do this. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I think back to what happened in 2008 when Russia attacked Georgia and used hackers to help them hit the Georgian uh, government and financial sector. What Russia did in, in Crimea in 2014, the green men aren't ours, they're not ours, they're not us. And then after they took Crimea, they said, oh, they're ours. So are these hackers under the guise of the government, related to the government, or completely on their own? We need to know that. And I think, first and foremost, so what, what you hit on, we have to hold these guys accountable, just like we did on the Barbary Coast. Go after them, indict them, make them pay a price. And I think it's great that they got the money back. We should take the next step and indict the individuals that did this. Well, let's talk about getting the money back. What role did cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, play in this? Because some people said you really couldn't pay these ransoms if you didn't have some pseudonymous currency like that. On the other hand, in the hearing today, one of the lawmakers said, you know what, we were better off because we could track it. So that's a, that's a great comment. I don't have the specific knowledge of what they did. And if I did have that knowledge, I think going into the details of it would probably uh, not be in our nation's best interest. So I'd step back from that and just say, our government has some great capabilities. I think what the FBI and the intelligence community do together is good for our country. We ought to go after some of these guys. And do we do it with other countries? Just from your experience, do we have to have other countries working with us? Oh, I think partnering with other con uh, countries is vital to us as a nation. You know, they, they need to know that we will help them. You know, this is part of international relations, just like we do in counterterrorism operations. You know, a lot of people say, well, why are you tracking people in our country? Well, they're trying to kill your people and we're trying to stop it. And we're here to help. I think getting that out, and I think this is one of the things that the administration can really do well is be completely transparent on what we're doing, telling them how we're doing it without giving up the tools and the trade secrets that help us find these cyber criminals mm -hmm. and find these terrorists. General, thank you so very much for your time. I really appreciate it. That's General Keith Alexander, IronNet Cybersecurity Chairman and Co-CEO. Coming up, the prospects for a global minimum corporate tax from former Irish Prime Minister John Bruton. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The G7 finance ministers last weekend agreed at least to a framework for a minimum tax for multinational corporations, something sought for years, but difficult, let's be frank, to bring to pass. We welcome now the former prime minister of Ireland, one of the countries that would be affected by such a tax. John Bruton also served as the EU ambassador to Washington. So, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for being back with us. Great to have you here. You have run a government. You've been in the head of a government. What do you think about this idea of a minimum tax? As I say, it's been talked about for years. Well, I'm very interested in this issue. In fact, it was, I was Taoiseach or Prime Minister when the 12.5% rate, which Ireland still has, uh, on all corporate profits, whether by Irish companies or multinationals, whether, when that was introduced and applying to all corporate profits across the board. Now, we understand uh, the, the pressure that's coming on uh, to do something about this because where, for example, should a digital company be taxed? Where does it make its profits? That issue has to be settled. Uh, is 12.5% enough? 
these are all questions that are currently being examined. And from an Irish point of view, we would like to see an international agreement. We'd like to see an agreement with the United States fully involved and accepting of the outcome. And I think there are, there are two separate issues here. One is the digital taxation issue, and the other is the minimum, minimum rate of tax issue. And I suppose then there's a third issue, what do you tax where? Yeah. And those are the issues that are currently being worked through in an international negotiation by the G7, by the OECD, and I think up to 135 countries potentially could be involved in the agreement, including India and China, which would be a major advance. If we could get an agreement, it would mean that we would stop some of the causes of trade wars and tax wars that are taking place and are bad for business. Do you have any sense of what it might mean for the coffers of Ireland specifically? Because I've read directly conflicting things. I've read if you go from 12.5 to 15, then you won't have the same companies coming to Ireland, basing themselves there, you'll lose money. I've read elsewhere, that's not right at all, that in fact there are all sorts of other reasons to be in Ireland. Do you have a sense whether it really costs the Treasury? Well, I think the reasons that people have come and invested in Ireland are many. One of them is taxation, certainly. But they've also come here because now Ireland is the only English-speaking country in the EE, in the European Union. It's the only common law country in the European Union. And most American companies are run by English speakers who are familiar with the common law. And we have a very highly trained workforce that's available with a lot of a technological infrastructure that's second to none. So those reasons are attractive and would continue to attract uh, businesses to Ireland. There would be some reduction in uh, the revenue in Ireland if we went to a minimum tax rate that was higher than our present one because some business might move elsewhere. Well, we can handle that, we think, uh, but obviously we're going to be very concerned to make sure that we get the detail right in this agreement. Well, let's talk about that agreement, because as I say, the G7 finance minister came up with at least a framework last weekend, late on Friday. At the same time, there are quite a few steps, as I understand it, between now and really implementation, because you have to get through the G7. You also have to have the, all the OECD. How, what is the likelihood we'll actually get this done? I think it will take uh, maybe two or three years. It's not going to be done next week. But we're, the direction of travel is a good direction of travel. We're, we're working towards an agreement. Obviously, Ireland has been very concerned that, that in the end, each country as a sovereign country decides its own tax rate because each, each country has to raise taxes to pay for its own services. But within that, within that uh, constraint, we want to see an international agreement. And our Minister for Finance, Pascal Donoghue, has been working very hard to that end on behalf of the European Union, as well as on behalf of Ireland. Uh, what are the politics within the G7 and then the G20? As I understand it, it goes G7, then G20, before you get to OECD overall. What are the politics? Who would benefit from this? Who would be for it and who would be against it? Well, I think the United States um, has a, an, an unusual tax system, which has, in fact, unintentionally encouraged American companies to keep their profits overseas because of the way America has settled its own tax system. And that's now causing problems for the United States. The United States is also concerned with the fact that some European countries, not Ireland, uh, but some European countries have been proposing special digital taxes on ta taxes on the profits made from digital trading. And the United States has said it would take retaliatory action if countries continue to persist with that. So we're hoping that we get an agreement that will settle all of these issues in one package and that there will be no major loser and that people will have time to adjust because what's really bad for business is a sudden change. A, a gradual change is something that businesses and countries can adapt to. Uh, finally, Mr. Prime Minister, in any negotiation, you want to make sure the person on the other side of the table has the ability to get to yes and deliver on it. Uh, to what extent would the people who are doing the negotiation be concerned, and I'll pick on the United States for the moment, about the question whether our Congress would back President Biden if he did agree to it? Well, that has always been a concern, right back to the ratification of the League of Nations with the United States. Other countries agree something with the United States and then the U.S. administration cannot get the treaty that it has agreed through Congress. So that is a problem. There are also potentially problems on our side as well. Uh, the European Parliament or individual member states might decide that they weren't going to abide by 
an agreement that was made. Uh, but I, I think we, we will avoid that because potentially everybody can benefit from this and we can have, we can move towards trade peace. We're at the moment moving towards a situation where the world is divided up into two blocks, uh, two blocks that are not willing to depend on one another. And of course, mutual dependence is the basis upon which we have enjoyed peace in the world. And if we move the world into two blocks, operating in two different economic spheres, we will have a lot of waste, a lot of higher expense and potential for conflict. So the more we can work on agreement, the better. Thanks so very much to John Bruton, former Irish Prime Minister. We're going to have much more with the Prime Minister coming up next hour on Bloomberg Radio, where we will talk about Brexit, which it turns out isn't over yet. This is Bloomberg. The clock is ticking on an infrastructure deal as President Biden is about to head to Europe tomorrow, leaving domestic matters on a back burner. Joining us now is Bloomberg contributor Jeannie Shanzano. Welcome. But great to have you back with us. So they've got the infrastructure, but they've also got a voting rights thing. They've got a, a George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. They got a lot of stuff to get done up there on Capitol Hill. What are the prospects? The prospects do not look good. As we saw over the weekend, Senator Joe Manchin released this op-ed. And of course, he said he is not prepared to support this For the People Act, the big Democratic Voting Act. He will support the John Lewis Act, which is a narrower act. But he also said he's not going to be thinking about removing or revising the filibuster. So those two things put the Democrats in a really difficult position. And it's June, and this is really a be-all or end-all month for Democrats in the Congress. They've got to move on some of this legislation, which also includes police reform, and they've also got some spending and budgetary issues on their agenda. So a lot to get through. And with this divided Senate and a narrowly divided House, it's going to be incredibly difficult. Okay, so Jeannie, I'm going to take your position now and look forward to the midterms. You're always the one eager to get to the next election. But there's a report <laughs> out from Third Way, I'm sure you saw yesterday, saying to the Democrats, you better watch it. Because if you want to hold your base, particularly among uh, Hispanic voters, among black voters, things like that, you've got to have a positive economic agenda. How much pressure does that put on the Democrats as they look forward to those midterm elections to get something done economically that really gives people some hope? There's a lot of pressure on Democrats. Democratic voters went to the polls in 2020. They voted to put Democrats in control of Washington, D.C. If they can't prove this summer that they can move, as you mentioned, on an economic agenda, let's take infrastructure, for instance, number one on the president's priorities. If they can't get this done, very difficult for them as they approach the 2022 midterms. And of course, they've got a lot of things working against them, including history, including redistricting, and including retirements, all working against Democrats. And of course, in the last century, we've seen what, 1934, 2002, the only time we've seen the president's party pick up seats in the midterm. And as Joe Biden heads over to Europe tomorrow, he is writing in the Washington Post and talking about the fact that this is the 21st century battle to prove democracy can work, to prove that we can do things, we can get things done to show Russia and China that autocracy doesn't work. And yet you look at our progress at home, it's not looking positive in terms of the president's agenda. So there's a lot of work for Democrats to do. Okay, so just briefly at the end, second guess the negotiation. It looks like President Biden really wants a deal. Does it look like the Republicans do? Because they aren't moving very fast. They aren't moving very fast, still very far away. We've seen the president come down to one trillion. We've seen him with the flat 15%. Republicans have gone up, but they haven't gone up enough. And of course, the clock is ticking as we keep talking about, and Repo Democrats rather, and progressives getting frustrated with President Biden, who is trying to negotiate with, uh, with Capito and other Republicans, not getting very far. And they're saying at this point, Maybe right. we've got to just move forward on our own, but that is going to be tough if they can't Jean hold both progressives Jean and Jeannie, moderates. Great like to have you Nancy. back with us. That's Jeannie Shanjano, Bloomberg contributor. And this is Bloomberg.